uh, share. Yes. I think uh, the permission is already there. It just says one, only one participant can share at the same time. But yeah, I'm, cannot... I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. I'm going to share. I'm going to share it, and then uh, we have one presentation so that we can drive through the whole presentation through the one set of slides, one, one deck. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, that's good. There is a lot of anticipation and uh, positive feedback about this. Mm. So hopefully uh, we'll have more of the uh, regular financial market participants who are always skeptical about blockchain. But uh, they are in a hole because they cannot... Uh, take care of many of the problems that they have encountered over the over the years without this technology and they don't realize it yet but <laughs> they're going well, to have, they're going to have to uh, yeah. come to the table in some way yeah. or form yeah i mean we can only shine the light on the problem and then show the solutions um, so it's going to take time all right, so I'm going to say that uh, uh, we have to get through a couple of administrative uh, administrative uh, things. One is uh, the uh, Hyperledger antitrust policy. So we are bound by the Hyperledger and antitrust policy which means that we have to obey the antitrust laws of wherever we are, including those of the United States, if you're from the United States, but any other country where you might be joining from, since we are a global um, SIG. The other uh, item is the fact that we have to be nice to each other, which means you can disagree with people without being disagreeable. I'm sure that money has heard this thousands of times, if not hundreds. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the point is that anybody is welcome to participate and, of course, give respect to the presenters, but also question them about things that you do not understand or you object to. So these are the uh, two things we have to really take care of. The uh, few other things, right? Um, one, I'm going to introduce money and have him uh, go through introducing his uh, collaborators. I've known money for a while. I've interacted with him. I have, we have launched a couple of uh, labs in Hyperledger and we have written a paper on CBDCs together which uh, takes care of one of the important payment legs and for which he had uh, come up with this dual, let's say, dual blockchain structure. One is to take care of the contracts. The other is to uh, take care of the cash flows, which is also a blockchain structure in CDM. So without waiting further, let's have money take us on a journey on what he has been working on for the past uh, few years. And thank you, Money, for showing up. And uh, I shall disappear into the woodwork, uh, which is 
where I belong right now. Thank you. Honey. All right. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you all for uh, joining us today in this presentation, an exciting one to talk about in our journey uh, to bring in zero knowledge proof and confidential assets into enterprise digital assets framework. Um, so we're going to tackle this thing in three segments. I'm going to give a you know quick introduction and you know uh, uh, outline the current status of uh, enterprise blockchain uh, and you know how we arrived at where we are. Uh, the second part would be covered by the Polymesh team. Uh, we uh, uh, I thank Adam, Amir, Robert, and others who are joining uh, today. So they would take us through the zero knowledge proof and how Polymesh implemented it. And then, you know, towards the end, I would again cover how we are applying Polymesh uh, along with the OTC digital, uh, digital asset framework. So, you know, let's jump into it. Um, you know, this brief introduction. Uh, we started off working together with Polymesh almost four years back. Uh, when they first announced a public blockchain, uh, that was purpose built for uh, digital assets, uh, uh, with, with, you know, um, specifically security tokens and in meeting with all the compliance requirements uh, with respect to uh, digital identifiers, security lifecycle, and then, you know, Adam can go through during his presentation. Uh, along the way, we also compared ourselves to see how we, you know, I mean, I, we explored options to see how, do you, how we would uh, use uh, enterprise or, or Ethereum-based solutions and one of the things is was what we did uh, about three years back, we, through the uh, labs, we brought in ERC-1155 token and then we open sourced it. And it was adopted for carbon credit and other potentially other areas within Hyperledger. And we continued our journey and, you know, and we did uh, based upon our proof of concepts with banks and exchanges. Uh, one thing came very clear that uh, Privacy became very critical, and so hence we, you know, we started working with Polymesh, and they already had a framework to work with zero knowledge proofs uh, a few years back. So uh, I would I would say less than two years back we started this journey, and now we have in a situation where we have integrated and we are ready to, uh, you know, launch this product uh, working with Polymesh. So let me go into the you know some background. This is largely to uh, to address regulations um, in enterprise uh, digital assets. Uh, regulations are key. So the first thing to look at is the uh, BIS, which is the uh, Bank of uh, Bank for International Settlements. So they classify into two sections: tokenized traditional assets into Group A and you know, and then uh, sort of Group One A and One B. And the way they look at it as to say is if these assets behave um, exactly as it is being currently uh, processed and conducted in, in a paper-based or traditional asset framework, they would be giving the same treatment with respect to uh, capital allocation and um, you know, reserves for the banks. If they do not meet that, they fall into group two, which is very punitive in nature in terms of uh, reserves and, and, and risk weighted assets. And it, it, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, calculations that go behind it. Uh, enough to say that most uh, almost all cryptos fall into the group two, which means banks will have to put 100% or even more than 100% of the actual uh, dollar amount using their own capital, which no bank is going to be willing to do compared to you know, very small amount in, in single digits for, you know, in a group one assets. That plays a significant part as to what kind of an infrastructure you're going to deploy uh, for, uh, for uh, you know, real world assets to be fully compliant. The other part of it, that's where they, the BIS addresses in multiple forms. One is, as I said, the groups, and then how do they arrive at by looking at the network interoperability? That's one of their criteria. And they recently came back in the December 2023. They came back with a clear indication that no permissionless networks for group one. Uh, uh, for group one, the reason being that they uh, felt that um, 
the banks will not be able to do KYC and all, all sorts of third party uh, uh, processors. Um, so just to give a quick glimpse into what that means, and here is the uh, the December 23, you know, they are uh, um, um, amendments to what they have previously described uh, for group, group on assets. As you can see, I just highlighted the section where they clearly see that since banks have limited ability to conduct due diligence and oversight, what they are saying is they decided that they will not be including crypto assets into group one, which means it's a very punitive for banks to process crypto assets, whether it is crypto assets, as we talk about the Bitcoins and the Ethereums of the world, or a, even traditional assets that do not meet these requirements. Uh, in addition, we also have custody requirements from these other agencies that wants to dem uh, demonstrate control of the asset. This is primarily targeted towards custodians and you want transfer guarantee to the right party, which means there's no unilateral transfer. Um, that means both you know, sender and receiver must acknowledge on chain um, to, to guarantee that the transfer is complete and final. So this puts a lot of burden on what kind of infrastructure you choose um, and how you would go about implementing your digital, digital assets for real world assets. I'll jump on to the next one. Um, again, to, to go further into details, one of the things that BIS specifies for bonds, loans, or basically any claims on banks, they say it's the same level, of, I just underlined for, for clarity, same level of legal rights as ownership of these traditional forms. And also they want to avoid any obligations not being, uh, not able to fulfill obligations for the banks if they have to be paid in full as composed to the traditional version. So essentially they want same rights, same uh, obligations to be conducted fairly uh, from both the traditional form as well as the digital form. The, the other interesting thing, which is important now is they specify commodities and say, same level of legal rights as traditional account-based records of ownership. Look at the differences. They don't talk about ownership you know, in, 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 in different sense of legal rights for bonds because securities processing, uh, where you could use IOUs or claims on banks, whereas commodities, um, it's actually must reflect records of ownership. As you can see, uh, we'll give an example of how why this uh, is, is critical for um, you know enterprise chains. So I just want to quickly re refer to a background of uh, what we see is in the evolution of the blockchain. This is our classification and no particular scientific me mechanism by which we chose this. Uh, you know, we know about Bitcoin and then, you know, we have the Ethereum that came in with World Computer. And one of the things that came up with the smart contracts, we, we all know about this, I won't go into details, but something that's important is the cap table is not encrypted, which means there's no privacy and enterprise uh, market participants, particular, particularly banks, hedge funds, do not want to reveal their positions on chain. So to uh, meet that, Mani, yeah. Uh, yeah. Explain what a cap table is to the those of us who are not uh, sophisticated. So that's just simply the ownership table for the various uh, you know uh, stakeholders in that particular token. Um, this is a, this is something that shows the in in Ethereum world it is nothing but your uh, your wallet public wallet address and the and corresponding uh, token and the amount you hold. That means uh, you know anyone can inspect the Ethereum chain and look at the uh, cap table and can determine who owns what because the you know the the keys themselves are are pseudo anonymous. That means through other mechanism, they can track your true identity. Uh, uh, that means from through off-chain mechanism and on-chain mechanism, they can eventually narrow down to who's holding what. And that's something the banks would not, particularly, you know, no market participant in enterprise would want to uh, reveal uh, to their competitors. So to answer that, you know, uh, I call them a third generation, we, we, the, the enterprise chains came up. These are built specifically for uh, on the model of IOU or claim on issuer model. Um, it primarily puts stress on participants. And also it, the way it works is that is information is shared only between parties are, are, uh, that are, are of interest. 
unlike in a blockchain, every information is broadcast to all other nodes. Here, only specific need nodes communicate. So it while it does address privacy, but it does kind of put bring back centralized cap table. That means, you know, typically an issuer or a transfer agent holds the whole cap table and all other market participants depend. That's why I call them trust and participants. So essentially it leads to pseudo privacy and I'll explain what that means. Um, and again, there's another question about qualified custody. And then this also have further issues about global custody. You know, uh, as you can see that there's a lot more stress on, on the public chains to bring in uh, zero knowledge proofs and a whole host of solutions are happening here. But as you can see here, pretty much most of the work are all on permissionless networks, which means according to BIS, none of them would be, you know, the public chains would qualify for group one assets, which means bank cannot directly use them for on a large scale uh, to support uh, real world assets. So that means you're, 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 you know, you're coming back to permission networks. And, you know, sensing this way is where Polymesh had taken this and come up with a Polymesh a private, but by the definition, Polymesh itself is public, but it is permissioned. So, you know, this is not a question of private or public, but it's more of permission. So that's where, uh, you know, Adam can go in more detail in a in, 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 in couple of slides. Um, the main important thing is that is it's purpose-built, uh, purposeful for financial markets. Um, they, they introduce the confidential assets and you have granular key management, which is lacking in the you know third generation enterprise solutions. Let me jump into an ex exact example of what, what's lacking in the third generation and how it's being solved. So if you look at the way the third generation, which is typically you can categorize uh, core data tokenization or demo ledgers you know, broadly into this category, uh, they all depend upon IOU or claim model. You, you, typically, an issuer would issue the tokens, and then they would distribute to in, institutional investors or whoever. You know, I, I generally put a name of custodian, but it could be anyone who is authorized to hold custody of the tokens. Uh, it could be called as a custodian here. What's important this is that is the issuer or the transfer agent is holding that cap table. It is encrypted, but is centralized. And the custodians do not really have direct control of the asset, rather they have a digital receipts. I, I, that's why I call them as a pseudo custody to the uh, asset or uh, the cap uh, to, to the assets in the cap tables. Now the quick question comes up is for example, if if the issue issued gold, it is equivalent to saying that they actually hold the gold under their custody and what you're getting is only a, a digital receipt. So one of the interesting questions comes up, what happens if that issuer temporarily goes down and if custodians want to exchange assets, they can't. You wouldn't really need that issuer or transfer agent to be always, always be present to process any transfers between any two parties. And that's also, where the centralization also, comes into the picture. Also, the, uh, uh, in case of bankruptcy, this is a very important uh, question here. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are many, many uh, drawbacks to this model, but, you know, the, to, to mimic, to be fair, to mimic what they are doing today in securities processing is essentially a transfer agent today holding uh, holding that cap table, or uh, you know, in, in paper form or in, in pseudo electronic form and, you know, settlements happen and then transfer agent, uh, you know, applies today in, in, in current world. So in that sense, what they're doing is we are mimicking existing world, so we are compatible. But the big difference is this in today's world, it all happens in in in, in a more of an end of day batch mode. Whereas once you move into the blockchain world, this is real time. That means real time, everyone is you know or the, the cap table is getting updated, which means the or uh, the stress on the transfer agent is even more, or the issuer of the transfer agent is even more prominent as opposed to traditional model. So there are, you know, technology risks, um, a potential, it, it, what if this it gets hacked or if it goes offline, the whole market could get shut down because of that. So that's the problem. Now, the solution is uh, to have a blockchain, which is where the cap table is decentralized but also encrypted, and that was a challenge that could be solved through zero knowledge proof, and you know uh, we'll hear from Polymesh teams shortly. Um, but this does solve the problem, as you can see an example here: the gold 
is issued and it is transferred to the custodian, the custodians hold the actual uh, cust uh, you know, equivalent uh, digital assets under their custody for various customers using different key sets. So that's even important which is not even possible in here. This is almost like everything is all, all mixed up together. You just have one set of keys here. Whereas here you have uh, separate keys for each account. So it gives you a much more robust infrastructure uh, and it, it, it gives you the ability to decentralize. So which means there are no single point of failures here as opposed to here. Any questions? Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate yeah. to ask. Um, if I could, when you refer to decentralized identity here, what, what does that mean and how does it relate to the cap table? Um, maybe uh, maybe Adam can quickly address that because it's much more important from Polymesh side. Yeah, I can do. So, um, so the way Polymesh works is that uh, so it's a permission network, as, as Manny sort of implied. Um, when you're onboarded onto the network, whether you're an individual or a, an entity or a company or a business, you receive an on-chain identity that's sort of referenced or named via a DID or a decentralized identifier. Um, so you, know, you can think of your decentralized identity as being your sort of pseudo-anonymous name on-chain uh, and as a, you know, it's sort of issued to you as part of the permissioned onboarding process uh, for Polymesh. Does that does that answer the question? Or, yeah. yeah, and I guess given where we're at, the BIS considers this sufficient for K Y mitigation of KYC risks. So, so in terms of the way the, the onboarding works in Polymesh, is that there is a so every user of Polymesh goes through like an identity verification process. Um, you know, which establishes some sort of basic facts, like are you from a sanctioned country or not, and so on. Uh, and you, you know, every user of the chain has to go through that identity verification process in order to be issued one of these on-chain uh, identities or decentralized identities. In terms of KYC for a specific asset, um, those kind of rules or, or conditions are driven by the asset issuer. So the asset issuer will almost certainly require you know additional forms of KYC that are specific to their asset or, or regulatory perimeter and so on. Um, but that's all entirely driven by each individual asset issuer. So the chain has a kind of global or chain level identity verification process, uh, but individual asset issuers are still expected to, you know, have additional KYC requirements or KYC, KYB, AML, et cetera, requirements that, you know, are specific to their particular asset and, and jurisdiction. Does this mean yeah. that, sorry, Mark, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I just to, just to want to add two more to it. Yes, we do have a layer two to address that specific question of, you know, control who sees what, uh, and that means an issuer can, uh, you know, exact. For example, we use Coda as a layer two, not not for tokenization, but as a as a messaging platform where the asset issuer can define what the KYC requirements are and they're only going to interact with those that meet their requirements. So this is a layer two solution that we have added on on top of this so that you really have, uh, you know, be fully compliant with BIS on an individual asset by asset. So as Adam pointed out, it's individual asset issuer can have on top of this layer set of controls uh, so that, you know, they know who they're interacting with and, in you know, uh, and, and they can set up their own set of rules. Go ahead, um, Vipin. Yeah, does this mean that the uh, issuer will uh, it will create a new DID uh, that will then uh, function as their DID, and it's somehow connected uh, to the overall DID in some way, or does it mean that there is a whole separate, uh, you know, a digital identity system? operating on in, for the benefit of the issuer. The second question is, what of this uh, technology uh, stack is shared with the issuer so that they don't have to go through this whole uh, process of creating uh, you know, a digital identity infrastructure, which it becomes a heavy lift for most of them, as we know. 
Um, so I, I can try and take that. So, so the so the way Polymesh works is that um, let's say every user, whether they're an individual or a business, receives as part of their onboarding one of these decentralized identities. Um, that decentralized identity can then be used to store or to hold assets, you know, a variety of different assets or as many assets as you want. Um, so that means that as an asset issuer, you don't necessarily have to worry about onboarding. You know, if your investor is already onboarded and already has an on-chain identity, then they can obviously use that on-chain identity. That they don't have to be re-onboarded. Um, in terms of who can do that onboarding, so you know what which entities are sort of allowed to onboard users to to Polymesh, it's a sort of federated system. So as I say, you know, Polymesh is a permissioned blockchain, so not anyone can onboard. So in order to be, uh, in order to provide onboarding services in Polymesh, a company has to kind of go through a process and effectively, you know, persuade the the um, Polymesh Association that they, you know, will apply the relevant sort of due diligence that onboarding process and apply the relevant rules and that identity identity verification process. Um, in which case, they can then be permissioned to onboard users to the chain. So. Uh, yeah, and that, that due diligence process by the association just looks like a, a normal due diligence process. Um, and in theory, you know, anyone that can pass that due diligence process could be uh, permissioned to onboard new users to Polymesh. I'm not, uh, Vivian, did that address your first question? I, I, uh, yes, indeed. And then the you know, second there is a, yeah. Sorry, there is a correspondence to uh, LEI because LEI has a registry, which is also decentralized in terms of onboarding. Yeah, so to, to add on to that, you know, as, as Adam pointed out, one of the ways you can solve the problem is that is someone like a, a CCP, a CSDs, which do handle today LEIs. And so they could actually, actually add, uh, be acting as an onboarding agent or, or a KYC entry point that only gives a KYC or, or a DID into Polymesh for, you know, as a network level. But again, it's up to the individual banks to decide they, uh, they can have their own independent KYC as it suits them. And uh, on layer two, they, they further filter it and say, you know, who they're going to interact with on what assets. So you really have a, a federated set of uh, rules by which who gets onboarded and how are they going to interact with each other? So that that gives you the control, which is what BIS are essentially the regulators are looking for. You know, you're not like spraying out your your security issues to everyone. Instead, you target who you really have relationship with or who you really are uh, intended to, because there are certain things, um, certain assets can only be distributed to certain individuals, and this goes jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So the issuer um, make sure uh, will make sure that that only those targeted identities would get those assets. So to go to uh, to further go forward into you know this is where it is interesting challenges. What's a qualified custodian? It, 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 this is an interesting problem. How do you demonstrate control of an asset if you are a global custodian and your cust uh, the investor is depending upon you to demonstrate that you have complete control of the asset? Can you claim that that role here? That's a very interesting question. That you know, I see some custodians are struggling with it. Um, but given the fact that if a, a transfer agent is offline, that completely puts a custodian under a lot of legal, uh, I would say, legal stress. What if the investor wants to move the asset and the custodian can do? How can they claim that they are a qualified custodian? So. This is something that over time the markets has to grapple with and come to a, a, a logical conclusion. This gets even more weirder on the side when you have collateral that's going to be used by CCPs for managing uh, complex instruments. Interestingly enough, this collateral is held is held by CCP on behalf of the banks who act as transfer agent. But the same transfer agent of the banks are also holding on the cap table on the collateral itself. It looks a cyclical dependency. I don't think that this is legally can be easily be or, you know, solved. Again, it, it's up to the market participants, but we think we are getting into slippery slope when there is cyclical dependency on the issuers acting or the banks acting as issuers and transfer agents, you know, uh, and then CCP is depending upon them. 
uh, this gets very complicated. Now, one of the ways they can solve the problem is to put this in a single transfer agent for all assets. Then we are back to the square one. Why do you need a blockchain? You know, we, you would never get an answer to it. Anyway, uh, to us, it's much more cleaner implementation. If you use a blockchain, it's distributed, it's, it's you know, and you use zero knowledge proof to encrypt the cap table. You get a clean implementation and this, it, it took us so long. And another interesting challenge is that is a lot of the, uh, the earlier implementation of zero knowledge proof are, are UTXO model. While it is easier to implement on the chain, uh, it, it's a bigger lift on application providers like us uh, to use UTXO model, particularly for every a transaction you need to generate a, a zero knowledge proof. And UTXOs can even have a lot of wallets spread around and you're going to generate proof will all slow down the whole system. Whereas Polymesh uh, handles that uh, as an account-based system on chain, that solves a lot of problems as well. Um, again, I just want, want to go over, we already went through this thing. What uh, OTC Digital do, has done is taken the zero knowledge proof from Polymesh and added on all these functions on top of that. I'm going to explain to that is how we built it is at the lower end level. La layer one is, uh, is a Polymesh chain and we use layer two as a CODA only for the workflows and business logic. And the most important thing from our point of view, we use CDM. That's the interoperable digital standard. Um, because this, this protects all the market participants not having to worry about the layer two or layer one dependency. You know, if there are changes happening here or more uh, features coming in these layers, or our, our application protects that from not having to worry about that. And the way it works is our, we have ledger services and we, we use zero knowledge proof server, which is actually supported by directly by Polymesh. So we just have to give the appropriate instruction the proofs are generated by the Polymesh proof server, and it's then uh, you know, submitted into the network for um, you know verification. And on top of that, we have our app services, and then we built our you know functions for it. But one of the important thing we want to say is that this is fully decentralized stack. There are no OTC cent centralized OTC services anywhere in this network. Everything is de deployed decentralized and they are connected via layer two using Coda. And then they interact with each other using layer one uh, on the asset level and then settlement level using uh, Polymesh. So that's critical to note that you know, a, a good implementation must guarantee not only decentralization of the entire stack, but also interoperability. All the way up to the you know uh, 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 up the chain, and that's why using a standard like CDM protects us because it's not only an um, interoperable digital standard, but it's also an interestingly a logical blockchain because it has properties that can link the life cycle or events of an asset, and hence. Uh, it has a similar uh, hashing mechanism uh, between the original asset definition and then subsequent lifecycle events. It's a good property to have because then it can be applied on any underlying blockchains. So we chose a CDM. For us, that's a much bigger smart contract implementation or valuable implementation because this is our CDM developed by the industry market participants. Uh, now it's been taken over by Finos Group, Finos. So you know, the, uh, adhering to the standard helps banks not to worry about the underlying blockchains. That's our approach. Uh, with that, I'm going to now hand it over to Adam uh, to go into more into the zero knowledge proof and maybe take over, Adam. Thanks very much. Uh, Manish, you wanna, um, well, maybe I'll just briefly introduce myself. So I'm, uh, great to meet everyone. I'm Adam Dosser, I'm uh, the head of technology at the Polymesh Association, which is a Swiss-based uh, not-for-profit that's sort of responsible for shepherding and, and developing the Polymesh blockchain that, uh, that Manny's uh, given a great introduction to. So uh, it's one of the features we have been working on for the last sort of uh, six or 12 months is uh, an implementation of confidential assets uh, on the Polymesh blockchain. And, you know, I think Manny did a great job of outlining why privacy and kind of confidentiality of things like positions and you know, balances and amounts being transferred between different uh, network participants uh, is useful and is kind of required um, under some of the regulations. Um, so the approach we've taken, uh, and again, Manny gave, gave some kind of great context around this and, and sort of rationale is that rather than trying to achieve privacy by sort of just ensuring that only one or, or a limited number of network participants have access to the data, which is you know, one approach that I think was a sort of 3G approach on, on Manny's previous slide. 
Um, in polymesh, we've taken the approach where we still want to have a single global state. So the same state seen by all network participants. It's just that uh, some of that global state is encrypted um, so that users still have privacy. And obviously in particular things like um, token balances and uh, transfer amounts are encrypted. So although everybody, all the network participants can see the state, they're seeing encrypted state. And obviously yeah, only those participants that, that should be able to are able to kind of decrypt that state and also um, execute transactions that, you know, that change that state. So for example, transferring assets. Um, so, you know, as Manny says, we, we've approached privacy via, I think your, your phrase was like, via maths rather than sort of networking or, or data hiding. Uh, so, you know, privacy via encryption and proofs rather than sort of, um, sort of make sure only certain participants have access to the data. Um, the other, uh, one of the other kind of key attributes that we've taken with our approach to confidential assets uh, is that they are account-based. So anyone who's used Ethereum is kind of familiar with, with this sort of account-based mechanism. You know, unlike uh, Bitcoin and Cardano and some other networks where they have these unspent transaction outputs or UTXOs uh, in Ethereum and in Polymesh, we do everything at account uh, at a account level. So you know, if you as a user have an on-chain identity, that will be linked to one particular account that you know will hold your Acme balance. And as your balance in, in Acme tokens increases or decreases, those balances are reflected on that single account. So it's not like every time you transfer or, or receive an asset, you have to sort of generate a new key uh, and you end up effectively having your position split across multiple uh, UTXOs. So I think, you know, the reason for doing that is it's a lot more tractable to reason about. It reflects, you know, what happens in the real world. It'd be you know, surprising if your bank account, you know, if every time you receive money into a bank account, you've got a new bank account number, that would be a kind of surprising and unusual way to operate. So I think it's a lot more kind of intuitive, let's say, to work in the account model. Um, so coming back to how we achieve confidentiality in Polymesh, we use a combination of uh, zero knowledge proofs that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, and something called uh, homomorphic encryption that I'll also uh, talk a little bit more about. So the idea of a zero knowledge proof uh, broadly, and I should point out this one, we have our, our kind of expert cryptographer uh, and, and uh, expert developers on the line. So if there are questions, I can you know, point, you, point you in their direction. They could probably give a more detailed answer. Uh, but you know, at a high level, the idea uh, behind a zero knowledge proof is you can kind of prove the validity of a statement. You, know, you can prove that a value is, say, greater than zero without actually revealing what that value is. So in our case, it lets users prove things about their balances, their encrypted balances on chain, without revealing what those balances are, which would obviously then sort of leak privacy. So we, we use zero knowledge proofs for, for that purpose. And I'll talk again a little bit more about those. Um, homomorphic encryption is a kind of clever encryption scheme. So the idea with homomorphic encryption is that if, for example, you have two numbers, let's say you have X and Y, which are both encrypted, you can add those two encrypted values together. So you can add the encrypted value of X to the encrypted value of Y. And your result, which will be, let's say, Z, um, will be uh, will be the encrypted value of X and Y. So in other words, you can kind of do simple maths on encrypted values and you know, keep the usual properties of math that you expect, i.e. You know, uh, be able to add and subtract and so on uh, values. So what that means for us in particular is you know, for example, if you have an encrypted balance of Acme tokens and you receive uh, another transfer, you know, you receive some more of those tokens, we can simply add the two encrypted values together on chain uh, to get a valid response or you know, a result which is equal to the, the sum of those two values. And you can do that all kind of in the encrypted space without having to decrypt everything, add it up and then re-encrypt it. Uh, so those are the sort of two kind of primitives that we use, zero knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption. And what it, it sort of allows us to, to keep this global state. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and again, uh, if there are any questions, just, just jump in and interrupt and either I'll answer them or, or I'll ask somebody else from the team to answer them. Um, so specifically uh, with zero knowledge, the zero knowledge proofs we use, um, they're non-interactive uh, zero knowledge proofs, which means that um, broadly speaking, you know, the, the person trying to prove something and the chain, which is trying to verify that proof, don't have to have a lot of 
sort of chat or don't have to have a kind of conversation back and forth. So it's not like I send something, the chain sends something back to me. I have to send you know, a response to that. The chain sends send something back to me and I send a response. It's a sort of single one shot um, proof that I send and the chain can verify it and be convinced that, you know, of, of the proof I've sent. So they're non-interactive. Um, we also use something called Sigma protocols, which are, you can kind of think of them as sort of single purpose proofs, so proofs designed for very specific purposes to prove very specific things. Um, and as a result of being sort of somewhat single purpose, they're significantly more efficient than some of the more uh, general purpose uh, zero knowledge approaches like ZK SNARKs that, that people may have heard of. Um, so one approach of these sort of Sigma protocols that we use is that they are more efficient and obviously efficiency translates to things like TPS and throughput and so on. Um, there are some other slightly more technical advantages. So the uh, zero knowledge proofs we use do not require uh, a so-called trusted ceremony. So some, some flavors of zero knowledge require, before you can sort of prove things in zero knowledge, require there to be a sort of ceremony where you create this sort of trusted string um, and the validity of the proofs sort of relies on that ceremony having run correctly. Uh, so it sort of introduces an additional complexity and also an additional kind of trust assumption. And there are you know, very good ways of, of running those trusted ceremonies where you only require one of n people to be trusted and so on, but it's still you know, it's an additional uh, complexity that, that we avoid by using these Sigma protocols. Um, I guess to get a little bit more specific around exactly what we use zero knowledge proofs for, um, you can imagine that if you have a token balance of ACME tokens, uh, suppose I have a balance of 100 ACME tokens and I want to transfer 10 tokens to Manny, for example, then I need to prove a, a few key um, attributes related to my current balance and the amount that I'm transferring. In particular, I need to prove that the amount I'm transferring is a positive number because, you know, I mean, you can kind of, I guess, intuitively understand it. If I try to transfer many negative 10 tokens and really, you know, I'm not sure but, you know, exactly what that would mean to sort of transfer someone a debt. Um, so you have to prove that the amount you're transferring is a positive number. Um, and you also have to prove that you have a sufficient balance to transfer the amount of tokens you're trying to transfer. So in other words, your current balance minus the amount you're trying to transfer is also uh, greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, you have, a, you have a sufficient balance and the amount you're transferring is a positive number. So those are you know, examples of the type of thing we use zero knowledge to prove. Um, there are some other kind of aspects of the protocol. So we also, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about it in the next slide, but we also, uh, Polymesh sort of has this auditor interface that allows you to, you know, whilst the data remains encrypted on chain, allows you to kind of uh, share the details of, of uh, transfer amounts with a third party, with an auditor. Um, and there's some, you know, some proofs required to show that, you know, uh, to prove that what you're sharing with the auditor exactly matches, you know, the amount that you're transferring. So if I'm transferring 10 tokens for that, you know, that I'm truthfully, if you like, showing that to the auditor. I'm not telling the auditor I've transferred 20 tokens when I've actually transferred 10 tokens. Um, so, okay, so we talked a little bit about homomorphic encryption, a little bit about uh, zero knowledge proofs. Um, I guess one thing that might be worth touching on, so, so that's how we keep the balances, users, token balances and transfer amounts uh, confidential. The other um, bit of data which is useful to keep private is exactly which asset is being transferred. So am I transferring Acme tokens or Tesla tokens, et cetera, or, or you know, Microsoft tokens and so on. So to do that, uh, we take a slightly different approach where we use um, so-called anonymity sets. So the idea is that if I want to transfer, let's say, uh, some Acme tokens to Manny, in addition to uh, transferring Acme tokens to Manny, I create some decoy transactions where I also, say, pretend or have this sort of decoy transaction where I'm maybe transferring Tesla tokens and Microsoft tokens uh, and so on to Manny at the same time. Um, but except that those decoy transactions only transfer a zero amount. So obviously that's you know effectively a uh, not really a, a transfer, it's a transfer of zero. Um, and by doing that, so in this example, your Acme ticker would be in a anonymity set of three. So it'd be Acme, Tesla, and, and Microsoft. And then like a kind of observer of the chain state 
won't be able to tell if this is a real transfer is for Tesla, Microsoft, or, or Acme in this example. Uh, and you can you, know, you can grow that anonymity set or shrink that anonymity set as appropriate for your kind of for the degree of privacy that you 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 need. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and there are some let's say efficiency trades off trade offs in terms of the size of the anonymity set and the you know the cost of of transfers and so so on. Um, so yeah, so that's how we uh, that's broadly how we. Uh, keep balances, transfer amounts, and asset tickers or IDs confidential. Um, let me just pause there and see if there Excuse are any me. questions. Um, yeah, yeah. There seemed to be one question. Uh, the first question on this uh, is about uh, from Jim Zhang. Is this based on Zither? It seems so far as it shares a lot of cryptographic uh, primitives. Uh, but with this, in this context, it will be good to draw a bright line between the so-called 3G stuff that you already have, which is, you know, ZK rollups, all, all that, all that, you know, Ethereum-based uh, upgrades that are coming soon, um, and your approach. So in terms of whether it's based on Zether, there certainly are some commonalities and maybe that's a better question. Uh, I mean, uh, Amir, I'm not sure if you're able to give a kind of brief comparison of some of the sort of differences and similarities between Zether and the Polymesh approach. So there's certainly some, some kind of commonality on that first uh, question. If someone yeah, sure. looks, uh, looks at the yeah, chat, actually, they, they, that, question is already answered but you're certainly welcome <laughs> I, to I don't have it. yeah exactly i appreciate it actually robert said that actually polymesh is based on the mercat which uh, you can see the white paper there uh, but just uh, very quickly the cryptographic primitives that polymesh uses uh, more or less are the same as cryptographic primitive that the ether uses for example for zero knowledge proofs as Adam was explaining, we do have, like, generally, we have two famous categories, like ZK snarks, which are more general purpose, and also Sigma protocols, both Polymesh and Zether. Um, and you can find other, uh, like, um, blockchain protocols that use Sigma protocols. Both Polymesh and Zether um, actually use uh, Sigma protocols for their zero knowledge proofs. And also, again, uh, as Adam was explaining, for Encryption scheme, which has this nice property of homomorphism, uh, we use LGML encryption, which is exactly like used by Vether again for uh, taking advantage of homomorphism properties. So we do share some like um, underlying cryptographic primitives with Vether, but there there exist differences in terms of like protocol details. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know the, the Zether paper is, is um, I believe, it's referenced in, in the Mercat paper. And there are, you know, th there are some interesting. So, uh, you know, I think the team of Polymesh are, are all sort of familiar with, with the Zether approach. There are some interesting uh, aspects, which you know, Zether I think didn't wasn't really sort of focused on securities and and the kind of some of the additional let's say constraints or requirements that securities have. So, for example, something that Manny mentioned earlier is no unilateral asset transfers, I can't remember the exact wording, but something along those lines. So, you know, in the Ethereum world, either with Ether or like an ERC-20 token, or even like an ERC-1155 and 1400 and all these other sort of uh, security token standards, they are all kind of unilaterally, like unilateral, unilaterally transferable tokens. So in other words, if I know someone's key or address, I can transfer them tokens, whether they want them or not. So um, in Polymesh, you know, using and this slide doesn't really sort of talk to my, I think that maybe the next slide talks a little bit more about it, but um, you know, we, we have this kind of concept that for a settlement to occur, you know, for an asset to move, you it's a sort of multi-step process where first of all, you create a settlement instruction. You then have all of the counterparties that settlement instruction affirm it. So whether you're the sender or the receiver and so on, you know, all of the counterparties across all of the legs in that settlement instruction, across all of the assets and so on, need to explicitly agree or you know, affirm that transaction once all counterparties have affirmed only then will it execute so that's you know very different to the kind of context or setting of sort of zether and, and some of the some of those sort of similar papers um 
and then the other the other kind of feature which you know we've talked about since like the you know the auditor functionality and so on which i don't believe was part of the original zetha paper this idea that you know as well as um encrypting balances under your own key you may also want to encrypt balances under an auditor's key and need to prove that the, the two balances are equivalent obviously without revealing the balance publicly um manny do you want to flip to the next slide if that's okay uh, and yeah, obviously in terms of questions, feel free to interrupt. I haven't got the chat up, um, but uh, we obviously have other members of the team as well looking at the chat. One, um, one of the, yeah, uh, you made it very clear. And I want to point out that in Ethereum, for example, there is the whole concept of dusting, which is uh, propagating taint across multiple accounts using uh, transfers from compromised accounts. So this uh, receiver affirmation is a very important property. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's important. It's, it's a great point, Bipin, right? It's, uh, it's important, I think, for a host of reasons. There's obviously regulatory reasons. There are you know, potentially tax implication type reasons. If someone drops some illiquid asset with a notional value of a billion dollars or a million dollars or something into your account, maybe there's a tax implication of that. Um, you know, so the dusting aspect. So you know, on Ethereum, if you really don't like someone, you can send them some, you know, some some uh, funds from a compromised account, and you know that user will probably will then have their account blacklisted by all centralized exchanges and so on. So yeah, certainly like lots of reasons why um, you know entities like the SEC and other regulators have mandated these types of uh, these types of kind of conditions on on real world assets or security tokens, tokenized assets. Um, Okay, so this slide kind of goes into a little bit more detail about the different sort of entities or actors involved with confidential assets. I'll just talk through them very briefly. Um, so you have the sender and receiver, which is somewhat uh, somewhat uh, self-explanatory. So you know the the individual sending the asset and the individual receiving the asset. And you know it's worth noting this could be the individual themselves, uh, or it could be their custodian acting on their behalf. Uh, but either way, you, know, you have an entity, either the custodian or the individual user that's sending the asset and, and correspondingly on the receiver side. Um, these entities need, you know, the usual stuff when you're working with the blockchain, right? They need to manage things like public-private key pairs. For, I think as Amir mentioned, we use uh, LGML uh, or twisted LGML keys or encryption uh, for these confidential balances. So there's, you know, some... So public private keys you need to manage or, or secure for that. Um, the sender of the asset also needs to generate these zero knowledge proofs that we talked about. So proving that the asset, proving the amount they're sending is positive, or they have sufficient balance and so on. Um, the receiver should verify the details. So you obviously make sure that they're receiving what they expect to receive, you know, the, the asset type or the, the, the asset and the asset amount that they're expecting to receive, uh, which they can verify based on the sender proofs. In other words, they can take that sender proof uh, and as a receiver, they can, if you like, decrypt it or extract the information they need to verify that they're receiving what they expect to receive. Once they've done that action, they can then affirm the uh, settlement instruction. Uh, you know, as we talked about, both the sender and the receiver both need to affirm. Um, and I'll maybe talk a little bit about incoming balances, but I'll, I'll just leave that bit for now. Um, you know, the other one of the other types of actors we have, which we talked about briefly, are auditors, and you can actually have you know one or you can have between zero and many auditors. Um, so auditors are sort of third parties that you know, for example, there might be a transfer agent or a regulator or the um, asset issuer or something like that who want to, you know, whilst whilst obviously the balances are all encrypted on chain, that third party wants to be able to you know maintain a uh, a sort of transaction log of, of everything that's happened that's related to the asset or the transfers and so on that are related to the asset. Um, so Polymesh allows you, allows either the asset issuer or the business or company that's creating the settlement instruction to specify one or more or zero or more auditors. Um, and then those auditors will effectively receive encrypted versions of what's, you know, what amounts have been transferred that they can then decrypt to, uh, to, to kind of maintain that Things like a cap table that, that Manny mentioned would be one application of that or a reporting, if there's any kind of reporting requirements and so on. Um, the third actor, which we haven't talked about so far, is what we call a mediator. So a mediator is 
So they they have all the properties of an auditor, i.e., they get to see, you know, like they they get to see exactly what's being transferred and so on between two parties and which asset and amounts are being transferred. Um, but they are also required to approve um, the settlement instruction explicitly. So. In other words, every settlement instruction has to be approved by all of the counterparties, so all of the people that are sending and receiving assets within that settlement instruction, and it also needs to be approved by any mediators associated with that settlement instruction. So the mediator, for example, might be someone like a transfer agent. Um, obviously, if you have you know kind of compliance rules you want to enforce, the mediator will be one way of doing that. Um, it may be you know, the exchange itself wants to act as a mediator and have final approval on all, all these settlement instructions uh, and so on. So, or maybe the asset issuer or, or, and so on. So, um, so that's the mediator. And the different actors have, you know, more or less all of them are required to manage these you know, public private key pairs so they can receive encrypted data and decrypt it. Um, you know, uh, mediators and senders and receivers are required to directly submit transactions on chain in order to affirm the settlement instructions, whereas auditors just you know, are just required to sort of read data from the chain and don't actually have to interact on chain. There are sort of slightly different sort of technical requirements, if you like, to, uh, to each of those different actors. Um, I, again, I'll pause there and see if there are any questions. I know I covered that slide quite quickly. Does anyone have questions? Please uh, uh, feel free. I, I, yeah, I, I can see there's only five minutes left on the call as well. So um, probably I'll I'll finish the sort of polymesh section here. I mean, this slide is sort of interesting. Maybe leave it on on the screen for a minute or for a moment or two, Manny. But this slide is really just to try to root some of the things we talked about, things like senders, receivers, auditors, and mediators, in you know real world. Um, uh, description. So like a sender receiver could be a custodian, auditors will be things like transfer agents, dealers, issuers, you know, anyone, or maybe regulators, the mediators might be transfer agents or CCP uh, in the case where there is a CCP uh, and so on. So this is more just to kind of translate, if you like, between the sort of more the polymesh or technical terms and, and what those, you know, who may actually be playing those roles in the real world. Um, so that, that's, that's the purpose of this slide. Um, I think with that, Manny, I know you still have a few slides, I think. So uh, I'm obviously conscious of the time. So um, we can we can probably leave the polymesh stuff there, Manny, if, if, you, if you have kind of some concluding remarks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let me quickly run through, you know, having talked to you, thanks, Adam, for or giving a good overview of it. I mean, what does it mean? How are we using? Uh, what's the practical use? So we are actually building with some uh, sponsorship, uh, building a commodity supply chain network is interesting because it's a global supply chain. They're starting off with precious metals. Um, and this is where it's interesting, the ownership moves from the miners to refiners to minters. So everything has to be tracked. And, and that's where uh, Polymesh Zero Knowledge Proof helps us a lot to maintain that relationship. And not only that, we are linking in our existing Odyssey Digital. This is also now being upgraded uh, as a wholesale trading network. For example, a goal that it starts from a miner, goes to the refiner and a minter, all happens in the supply chain network. But then when that is ready for trading in the commercial marketplace, we actually burn that asset in digital asset on the supply chain, minted on the uh, digital asset network on the wholesale side. And that's how you're able to do interoperability and transfer of the assets. So that this could be traded in the marketplace. And again, vice versa, if they really want to bring, bring it back and melt it for whatever reason on the road, they would burn it here and bring it back here. Zero Knowledge Proof helps a lot in also maintaining uh, uh, auditors. Means if you are minting something, how do you maintain that? How do you know that that's the, what, what you have uh, in real world physical uh, gold matches to what's on chain. Uh, zero knowledge proof allows you to break, uh, create proof of balances and that can be verified by auditors, which means now you can go to the next level saying that if you want to build, uh, let's say a, a commodity fund, which is fund of, the, uh, of underlying uh, precious metals, you would actually hold those metals or digital assets in collateral account, freeze them, and let know of an auditor who can actually in real time uh, monitor those uh, accounts. And then you would be actually creating fund 
uh, funds and issue those funds in the wholesale market. So you really are linking in a physical market to a trading uh, trading market, and that's where the real application comes in. So, uh, it, you know, without these interoperable asset transfers, it's very really hard to have two isolated instruments networks. But again, this is where uh, Polymesh also helps us in, in in transferring these assets uh, between the networks. Uh, I don't know. We have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to go through one example of how actually happens. We use an OTC Digital, which is in this case. I'm taking a simple example of two investors, uh, two investors, uh, you know, exchanging an asset, and they invoke one custodian, so that makes life easier. So the trade is done between two of the investors, and let's say an RFQ or any other uh, secondary market. That trade information is in CDM, so the investors and the custodian know the actual trade details. So the custodian, because this is a custodian, is the same custodian for the both investors. Custodian will initiate a settlement instruction on chain on Polymesh followed by generating the proof of balance for both, you know, for, for the investors, depending upon whether it's a single asset or uh, dual assets, whether it's DVP or a simple payment or, or, or a delivery. And then finally, the custodian issues, a, a, you know, verify and approval settlement, and that gets recorded on chain. So, you know, very quickly, I, you know, this is what I'm showing, but it gets more complex when you have multiple parties and we have multiple networks, but the idea is the same that you would take the asset, you would sub initiate the transaction, submit the zero knowledge proof, and also the parties will verify, and that gets finally settled on the network. With that, I'll stop here because of lack of time, and you know, any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah, it is always a pleasure to have you guys here. And of course, uh, with such a complex topic and breadth, it's very difficult to cover all the points. Uh, but uh, I want to ask whether any of these presentations are shareable. And uh, of course, uh, it's been on the chat that, uh, you know, you can ask your questions to Will uh, at uh, polymesh.network. Yeah, and I would that, check with uh, yeah, I would I would check with Adam, and we definitely we can share this uh, uh, the presentation with with the group. Yes, and uh, you know uh, we discussed having a demo demo, which is going to be more than just one hour, uh, which will um, once you have a little more clarity and closure, then. Um, you know, it's it's very nice if you could come back and do a demo. That would be a fantastic thing. Um, yeah, and we will do. All... You know, yeah, the, yeah, the coming months definitely we can come back. You know, if there's enough interest in the audience, yeah, they're more than happy to come and give a demo. Well, let me tell you, this uh, this call has generated more than uh, thirty-one uh, people participating in the middle of the week at 10 o'clock, which means uh, it must be interesting to the audience. Uh, but, you know, more, we are not specialists on ZK proofs. Um, I was a participant in the ZK standard, first three ZK standards, uh, you know, which have been still ongoing. The next one is in Berlin. So if you are in Berlin, uh, please register for that. And uh, the ZK standards is where the real, you know, nitty gritty work on the academic and uh, deep level on ZK proofs is being done. I hesitated to post this on the ZK proof uh, standards list, which I'm a member of the Slack, uh, but uh, Thank you for coming and presenting. Thanks to Money, Adam. It's uh, it's eleven oh three, Jeff. Uh, so that's I why I just had one real quick one, yeah, one okay. quick question. Go, go ahead. You know, I, I think maybe some know I'm a co I'm the co chair, one of the co chairs of the supply chain city, and we'd really like to see that demo because it crosses a lot of areas that we're looking at around. Um, I guess some of this is fintech, and so I'll be curious in having 
talked about having uh, Parmesh come back, maybe a duel, something we should talk about, maybe having a duel, two, uh, a presentation for two, two groups. Yeah, yeah, we could have a general presentation. I don't want to make too but, many people on there, but. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, okay. Especially, it's really got a lot of FinTech stuff where just back makes some stuff, and I think this Parmesh has got part of that in there where you could probably take loans out on some of that, you know, the refiner smoke, for example. Um, stuff in the warehouse, so we're really interested in seeing it. So I just should I talk to you offline then? Um, yes, we'll at the uh, polymesh polymesh back and, and see if polymesh is willing to do the, the demo for two groups supply chain group and your finance when they, they fit together. Always, I mean, two groups are kind of fit together anyway. <laughs> supply chain and finance, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. sure. I'm sure we can arrange something. Okay. Um, I will put the chat up on the uh, meeting page, so you should be able to see Will's uh, contact there. And thank you again, um, Jeff. Thank you, Money, Adam, and Robert, and whoever else I missed on your team. Uh, and uh, this has been wonderful. And hopefully this is what is going to make a difference in real world assets on chain and good luck to you and okay. thank you thank, thank you very much thank yeah. you thanks cheers thanks